Hi! Hope you can all see me and hear me. Actually, no. Did I mute myself? Uh, let me know if you can hear me in the comments before we get started. I think you can hear me. Yes, give me a thumbs up or just tell me yes in the comments that you can hear me. Otherwise, you see my mouth moving, but you can't hear me. Let me know and I'll make sure to double check my sound and what not it. Yes, you can hear me. Yay! Okay, awesome. All right, let's get started. Uh, where's everybody joining us from today? I see quite a few on here today. I know yesterday was kind of crazy. I, I didn't know if I was going to be able to make it onto Facebook here at all. So then I was just waiting and hoping like, let me in, let me in, let me in Facebook. I just want to do this live. And then I finally got on, but it was late. So I'm sure a bunch of you missed me and then you couldn't find me on Facebook. And if you do have friends that are hopping on too, if they can't see me for some reason, just tell them to refresh the uh, Facebook app or the screen and then usually bloop, I'll pop up there. All right, from Pennsylvania. Wow, nice, nice, nice. Jennifer, you can hear me too. Awesome. Very good. So today, uh, yesterday we talked about uh, marking our pieces. And these are from the PDF. And if you don't have the PDF, I showed you how to go ahead and mark your paper pieces. And I don't know if you're all caught up from yesterday. I told you to screenshot this little uh, block chart so that you would have a sense for where all the pieces go because they are mirror images, half of them, top and bottom, left to right. So it can get confusing. I even confused myself. Twin Cities, hello, hello, Laura, welcome. So um, if you haven't had a chance to mark your pieces yet, if you uh, for by chance ordered the paper pieces, then I would go ahead and mark them so they, they correspond to this little block chart here and if you didn't get a chance to screenshot this yesterday go ahead and do it now but you can also do it later after the live over when the replay's up as well so you can just follow along now if you want to let me go ahead and put that to this side so uh today we're going to talk about picking your fabrics whether you want to do a uh, singular fabric for your background like i did for the top mug rug here the background pieces are all the same fabric right they're just cut so they fit in snug with the hexagon flower and they have a straight edge to make a mug rug. So I want to show you the other samples I made too so you can get kind of get an idea for what you can do with your fabrics. So the next one I made was this version. Let me center that. There we go. And as you can see, I stuck with one fabric for all the hexagons, which is pretty common right same thing as this one just one fabric for all the hexagons except for the center one obviously and same thing here I did a different hexagon in the center and this is the same fabric in all the petals I guess of the hexagon a friend sent me this whole bundle and they all had these perfect greens that go together with this red go figure and I was like oh my god I need to make a scrappy version so that's why you have this scrappy green background. So you can play with how you want to place different colors in the same color group. So you get a little fun mix of prints there, right? And if you have a lot of uh, scraps in your scrap bid, perfect time to use them. And then this one are remnants from uh, my <laughs> mask making days of last year. Good Lord. Um, so I just used up scraps for this one as well. So one print in the center, different prints for the petals, and, and one print for all the outside fabric. And this is from Caterina Rochella's um, Esoterra collection. If you're familiar with her, she's a art gallery fabrics designer. So this one was something fun. I just used up all my scraps. And then I decided I need to make a solid version too, right? And these were all little scraps that I had left from a project I made a few years ago. And then, okay, I'm like, let's just use them all up. It's a fall mug rug, fall colors, yes. And I don't know, I think I do like working with prints, a mix of prints like this, even though it reads as one solid, like the blue. But it has the little details in it that you can see, like little speckles and whatnot, right? 
but then if you like solids this is the way to go too or you I could have done one color all solids in one one color weight right in the outside all the edge pieces and done one color here and one color for the center but that's why I say just play with the um, can you see the back oh yeah yeah definitely these a uh, couple of them I fused but I left one not fused so that you would that I could show you the back purposely so this one I haven't even trimmed and if you can if you compare let me show you these have already trimmed off the little ears here right the little points that stick out so it's clean on the back and I already, already fused this to uh, uh, the fusible pellon here and then this one I fused it too just that I haven't trimmed it yet so that's why you see this little raggedy edges here see they're not trimmed off yet because I haven't trimmed it off I want to show you how I do it and when you can go about doing it. But this one I already fused to the um, fusible fleece, as you can see. So they're stuck together. And then this I left for last because I haven't finished uh, fusing this. So I can show you the back. But like you can see here too, I just worked with reds and pink. And who doesn't like strawberries, right? Strawberries and cherries can never go wrong, I say. So that's what I stuck with here. And actually, I made this as part of the um, English Paper Piecing Academy when I was showing, demoing how to make these hexagon flowers. And then for this, I decided to go scrappy low volume prints for the outside pieces. So you got, they're all reading kind of off white, whitish, right? But they have a little bit of gray, a little bit of black, a slight bit of cream mixed in, but it's kind of one solid that reads as a what type of background, right? It, it's not completely out of the view. It looks weird or anything. Well, I think I like it. I like scrappy. And this also, I used a lot of my scraps that I had left over from other projects, little pieces that, you know, you save it for a rainy day and this is the perfect time to use it. So this one, I haven't fused it to my fusible, um, fusible fleece yet. And the reason is so that I could show you the back, just like Keith was asking. All right. So if I flip this over, you can see all the seam allowance. I stuck with the 3 8 inch here so I could so it would show better for you as well. And all the seam allowances are just nice and pressed because I like to press my projects after I take the uh, papers out. It's always a good good thing to do so that your um, your pieces, they're pressed into place even though you wrangle them taking the papers out and they might get a little wrinkled just give it a good press and it looks like new again and it's nicer to work with as well and then uh, when you're ready to fuse it with your fusible fleece it'll just fit nicely together like that and was there something specific you wanted to know about the uh, back keep let me know in the comments and I'll explain if there was anything in particular. Let me give it a second because I know there's a little bit of lag. So I'll give you a sec few seconds to answer if there's anything. Otherwise, I will go on. So if you are familiar with uh, the different seam allowances, you have quarter inch seam allowance and they also have a 3 8 inch seam allowance that you can work with. It's just curious about the fabric. Oh, okay, yeah. It all the seam allowances are obviously folded in towards the center because that's oh hi Lucy because you're working with English paper piecing, and as we remove the papers like that, you just unfold the uh, fabric a little bit and un release the papers. So that's why you'll have seams that are butted up against each other in English paper piecing. So it's not like hand piecing. Mm, Jennifer, yeah, I for mug rugs, I, li I like to use fusible fleece more than just regular batting just because it's easy. And fusible fleece has little glue on one side, little glue dots. I don't know if you can see it here. It looks like little glue specks. And one side is just, you know, plain. So you would fuse it towards the side with the little glue dots. And that way you don't really have to do any quilting per se, machine quilting or hand quilting either because they're fused together. 
Hi, Kathy. Good to have you here. Fabric backing for the quilts. Yeah, we'll still have a fabric backing for this. Let me show you the one sample that I finished. So this was the sample that you guys have seen. And the backing, ta-da! It's the same as the binding. So it's a self-bound mug rug. Super duper, it makes it easy and a quick project that you can actually finish this week. And no machine sewing needed either. So if you did traditional binding, you would more than likely want to sew on the binding with the sewing machine, but because we're doing this self-bound mug rug project, you don't need a machine sewing at all. We're just gonna fold the binding in and line stitch it to the front. Where were you born, Lucy? Pennsylvania? I think someone mentioned Pennsylvania earlier, right? But so that's a reason I like fusible fleece, but you could very well do um, regular quilt batting too. I have a lot of remnants and Franken batting too. Good time to use up your smaller remnants that you have uh, trimmings from your quilt projects. Just um, uh, do a crisscross zigzag stitch to, frank to make some Franken batting. That's what they call it. And then use it for mud rugs because you're just going to use these around the house anyways. And it's not, you know, something that the batting won't show on these little projects. And it's perfect time to use up all your batting scraps too. But I do like the uh, fusible fleece because it just makes it easier. And I don't have to think about, oh, how am I going to quilt this? Or I could even go, like even this one that's finished, I can go in and do machine quilting or hand quilting on it now too. You were born in Erie, Pennsylvania? Oh, nice! See, it's a small world if you think about it. So that's what we're going to do with fabrics. But if you have regular batting at home, just use that. That's fine too. And I'll show you how you can apply that without quilting it too. What we do, we just use a little bit of glue. Or you can just do big stitches to uh, baste it to your uh, fabric and the batting, which makes it really easy as well. But if you do have a chance, Ever a little, a little, a little whoop, I can't talk today. If you do have a chance, do try out the fusible batting. For smaller projects, it's like a game changer. It's so much fun to create with it, and it's quick, and it's something that you can make really fast without having to overthink. And you can always go back and add big stitch quilting, embroidery, whatever you want later. It's not something like, oh, shoot, not that not I use fusible fleece, I can't do anything with it. No, you can always go back because it's stuck and your fabric won't shift as you're quilting it. So you're still good. I've all, I've gone back several times on projects that have just done the fusible fleece and not done any quilting first, but gone back and added it later, later, which is really fun. Let's see. So what are we going to do? Do, 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 do? Ah, So for your fabric requirements, if you just want to stick with... Um, one fabric for all your background pieces. I can give you kind of rough cut that you need. You're gonna need at least like a fat eight, which is nine by 22 inch piece to get all these pieces, unless you're using it from uh, your scrap bin, right? Then try to fit your shapes onto pieces of fabric. I'm just gonna do this one just to show you what I mean. Just make sure that it has enough fabric around it so you can cut and fold it over onto the paper piece right so you don't have to be exact with the seam allowance on these pieces just because this I like how it's neat on the back with the even seam allowances but it's not really gonna show anyways so you're okay if they're a little bit you know off because you're using your fabrics from your scrap bin that's perfectly fine too and if you happen to use these um, templates, the fussy cutting templates, you can just make sure that that fits inside. Let me move this out of the way so it doesn't look so busy. So this is just a strip from a jelly roll. So it's two and a half inches wide. So I'm taking one of my uh, A pieces, let's say I want to put it on here, and I'm using a three eight inch 
seam allowance on this little fuzzy cutting viewer here and I place it right on top and then I know it fits because this is the seam allowance that's going to go over the fabric, right? And I can just trace this. I like to use uh, friction pens because they just disappear when you iron them. And these seams, I'm not too concerned about the ink reappearing or whatnot. There's a lot of discussion about that because this is just going to go inside the part that I traced. That's where I'm going to cut and that's just going to disappear in the back behind the padding anyways so it won't show and then you would just cut the fabric let me see scissors and you can definitely use uh, rotary cutters and uh, acrylic ruler when you cut your pieces you don't have to hand cut so now because I use this fussy cutter here I know for sure, let's do the A2 piece, that it's going to fit inside. And I have 3 eighths of a seam allowance all the way around. Let me make sure I didn't miss any questions. Da -da -da. Let's see. Oh, Jennifer, I answered your question, right? So it makes sense why I would just fuse it to fusible fleece. But you could quilt it even with the fusible fleece too. No problem. Okay, I didn't miss any questions. Yay! So then you would go ahead and if you don't have the fussy cutting templates, that's fine too. Remember I showed you yesterday how you can add a seam allowance after you trace your pieces to make yourself fussy cutting templates or you can just eyeball it too. No quilt pulleys here, okay? So I haven't pressed this piece so it's going to bubble up but you could technically just place it there, eyeball it, right? Like that and if you have a rotary cutter then you would put your ruler and then you could just cut right there. And you'll be good. So you don't need to have fuzzy cutters like this, but it's helpful. I like it, personally. And I like neat backs. I don't know, for some reason, I like it when it's clean on the back side, but you don't have to be like super picky. And let's see. So if you wanted to do just one print for all your back pieces, and if you happen to have a lot of big pieces, then you're going to need at least a fat eighth. But if you do decide to do um, fussy cuts where you actually want a uh, repeating pattern, then you're probably going to need more. Let's say you want to do stripes or something that you want to match up, then you're going to need more fabric. But in general, a fat eight should be good. Uh, let's see. So for the hexagons, when you do the hexagons, they always fit on these two and a half inch strips really nicely, which is great for when you buy jelly rolls and you just want to make a whole bunch of hexies. See how it just fits in there perfectly? Let me match it up there a little bit. So with a quarter inch seam allowance, it'll fit in nice, but with a three eight inch, I will show you. Let's look it on the print side so it's good contrast. It fits this way where the flat edges are matched up to the two and a half inch sides, right? But if you for some reason want to face your hexagon this way from point to point, then it'll stick outside the seam allowance a little bit. Let me overlay this like that. Because it's three eighths of an inch, right? But Unless there's a particular print that you want to repeat a certain way on your hexagon, you're safe if you just put it the flat side up against the two and a half inch strip like that. Uh, the back of my EPP worked of the doesn't look as neat as yours. You just cut with scissors? Yeah, see? Lucy's she's a long time quilter and she's doing that too. That's fine. Here's her comment if you didn't see. So you can definitely eyeball. That's the one good thing with smaller projects too. They're very forgivable. Yeah. 
Anna, let's see, Carolyn. Oh, well, I'm glad you picked in today, Carolyn. I sent the uh, email with the link to yesterday's video so you can catch the replay. But if you look here on my page too, if you scroll down, you probably, the yesterday's video will probably still pop up. But I sent the direct link too so you don't have to search through Facebook because I don't know, it's been acting really weird lately. I, sometimes I don't even see stuff I post. Then I go, I thought I could have sworn I posted something and then I don't see it for days and then it'll pop up. Okay, and for your, um, let's see here. So if you do use a uh, fusible fleece for your um, backing, I mean for your batting, the size that you would need at minimum would be a nine and a quarter inch square. That way it'll fit perfectly after you remove your papers and place it on top of the fusible fleece. Now, if you do use regular quilting bat, quilt batting, like warm and natural or warm and white, then I would go bigger, at least a 10 inch square, just to give yourself a little wiggle room since it'll probably shift as you're working with it. Versus the fusible fleece, it's more of an exact piece because we're gonna fuse, fuse it together with the little patchwork top here. Da -da -da. I'm missing anything. Okay. Then let's see what else was like. So da -da -da. uh and if you do use lighter pieces like this, I wouldn't use warm and natural because it's kinda um uh, yellow tintish or what would you say? Nude beige. It'll show through on the white and it'll make it look dingy. So stick to warm and white or fusible fleece that's white too. That way your white prints look nice and white too. I learned that the hard lesson. I used to be hell bent on sticking to natural, nothing that's been bleached, but then it ugh, didn't look so pretty. So warm and white and or uh, fusible fleece. And the backing fabric, you just need a 10 inch square as well. So if you happen to have um, not charm packs. What's the next size? Oh, why do I not remember all of a sudden? Yeah, mini charm packs, charm packs, and come on, <laughs> trivia. <laughs> why did I forget those ten-inch stacks of fabric? Oh my god, it just whoosh, just left my brain. But you just need a ten-inch square of fabric. Layer cake. Good grief. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> I can't believe it. it just like left my head. Oh, wow. Yeah, it hasn't even been that crazy of a day. But yes, it left my brain for a second. But yes, layer cake. That's all you need for the backing. So this was a 10 inch, oops, this was a 10 inch square too. That's all I needed to fold it over on itself twice and to make this self enclosed binding on this mug rug yeah oh my god how do i forget layer cake ah, quilting glossary quilt b or well, spelling b or <laughs> vocabulary b i would fail so bad so yeah just a 10 inch backing fabric piece that's all you need and if you have scraps too just you know piece a few pieces together and make it a 10 inch square. You don't have to be so picky. And then what else do we need? Uh, da -da -da -da, ba -da. And, and when we do the actual basting to the papers, I'm gonna show you glue basting because there's a reason why I want you to stick to glue basting these pieces in particular, the outside pieces, because we don't need to make it hard for us. I'm gonna show you something I'm going to teach you the rules first, and then we're going to go and break them right away. Let's see. Uh, uh, and we're going to baste our pieces. Yes, we are. Okay, so we're going to glue baste. I'm going to show you a few pieces. Let's put that away. And since I have this one, I can go ahead and start with this. And any uh, washable school glue is fine. I like to use Elmer's. 
the disappearing purple or just the clear white one. And then also I have these um, blue pens. This is a Fonts and Porter one. And then they, I think I have a sew line too. I know I put it here, but it's gone. So sew line, Fonts and Porter, all the blue pens that look like these, they're all manufactured at the same company. And you can find these glue sticks. Uh, Fonts and Porter is easy to find like at um, Joann's. Soul line, I've never seen Soul line at Joann's or Michael's, only at online or at cold shops. But this one's easy to find if you want to try a glue pen. But hello, back to school, perfect time. And since I don't want you to go out and invest in a lot of you know products until you experiment, see what you like better, then decide. So if you have kids, they got Elmer's glue sticks at home, as long as they're the washable kind. Go grab one and just glue paste with me. They won't know. Okay? So I'm going to use the purple so you can see better as I'm glue pasting. So I'll just take that out. And let's take this. Where did my A2 piece go? So I want to make sure even whether you use the printed templates from the PDF or you're marking your pre-cut templates, Make sure that you're looking at the letters as you're glue pasting. Don't put them facing down so then you won't see which piece you're working with. And another reason for that is because we're going to put a little dab of glue on the center. I'm putting extra so you can just see. Don't You don't need to put this much, okay? I just want you to be able to see here. Do as I say, not as I do, okay? <laughs> and then we're going to go ahead and place it center it on the fabric so unless you were trying to do like an exact fuzzy cut just kind of eyeball your um, paper piece on top of the fabric and you're good to go and it's on the back on the wrong side so this is the right side of the fabric so we're going to put it on the wrong side of the fabric and I put a little bit of glue on the center that's the reason also why we don't want to put glue on the um, printout the printed letters or the written ones because that'll transfer to the fabric with the glue, okay? So now we got this and it won't shift on us, which is nice. It'll just stay stuck, but it comes off really easy, see? That's the nice thing with these uh, school glue sticks. They're tacky enough, but not too tacky, as long as you don't put like a whole lot, right? And then we're gonna go ahead and base this. Um, General rule of thumb is to start with the short side of your pieces, but always experiment to see what you like. So as you can see, I put the glue here. Just avoid it right next to the edge. Don't put glue right on the edge here because that's where we're going to be sewing and we don't want it to be really stuck to the fabric because then that's when it's hard to push the needle through when you're sewing your pieces together. So just right away from the edge. And notice how I go all the way into the fabric. Not just on the paper, but over the fabric too. That way, when I fold it over, it'll hold down the little corners on the fabric as well. So if I didn't put glue here on the fabric, these pieces will be flapping around a little bit. And then I put uh, glue on the fabric here. And go all the way down. And remember the A2 piece, where does the A2 piece go? Let's look at our little cheat sheet here, the block chart. A2 goes right there, right? So it has this edge. Oops, I'm sorry, I shook the whole thing here. A2. So this edge is going to go under the seam of uh, the binding, right? This is where all the binding goes. So technically, if you were working on a block that there are multiple blocks where you're going to sew them together side by side, then this is not going to be a raw edge anymore, right? But this is the time where we break the rules. 
Let me go and finish this third side here. So technically, when you do glue-based or thread-based your pieces, you would I'm going to show it just for the sake of this demo. We, you would put glue there, and we would base this piece, um, like all the edges like that, right? And this would make up the eight piece right there, right? But the thing is that when you have a piece that you're just going to make one block, there's really no point in basting this final side because after you sew these sides together, this side here, and then you sew this side, you end up sewing these little corners and it's a pain in the butt to try to reopen the seam allowance to get that clean edge and to remove the papers. Now, if you're sewing multiple blocks together, then yeah, baste everything. But when we're making a mug rug like this, there's no point. So we'll just leave this little bit open. Don't baste it. Let me check Jennifer. So I'm reading. So when initially cutting the fabric, we should choose the templates that have the added seam allowance. Yes. Yeah. Anytime you cut fabric, you always have to have the, add the seam allowance. You can decide whether you want to do the quarter inch seam allowance or three eighth inch. That's your uh, personal preference. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to leave this edge open. See how I can stick my finger in there? Right? But it's not moving because I put a little glue on the center here to keep it in place. Uh, Laura, do you mean these little ears here? These? Like you can see on my white one, see the little ears? After I fuse it or after you um, thread based or pin based to your batting, then it's going to look like this, right? It'll still have the ears like this piece. Do you see? Because I haven't trimmed off what would be the seam allowance on this piece yet. See how it's not finished all the way to the edge, the seams? Because, let me put, 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 let me place this A2 piece over here. See how it fits perfectly right there? That's where it would go, right? But remember, I didn't base this piece, the one side, the final side. Let me put it upside down. So that's the seam allowance and we're going to trim it all off. And after we trim it all off, that's when you get a piece that looks like this one. And then you'll see that the A piece here, see how it's shorter? Because I trimmed off the seam allowance here. But that's how you get really clean seams that are sewn all the way to the edge and it's fused to the fusible fleece so you won't unravel. Hope that makes sense. So that's the reason why I don't like to baste the final, the outside pieces. So if we go over here, all these, these sides, I'm not going to glue baste. I'm just going to leave them open. But if you do feel more comfortable basting everything, go ahead and glue baste all four sides. That's fine too. Oh, the hexi does not have ears. The hexagon, let's see. The hexagon does never uh, never has ears because all the sides are glue basted in and they all all the corners meet in the center. Let me show you. Let me actually let's do a hexagon. Because I got hexagons. Why not, right? So let's say what do I want for the hexagon? Anyways. Ah, orange strawberries. Why not? Let's uh, let me open this up. So this is by um, Atsuko Matsuyama. I love that designer. And I do prefer to um, 
trace on the right side. Especially if you're going to fussy cut, you kind of want to see exactly where you're cutting, right? And tracing. Let's see. Where did my... Ah, here's my hexagon fussy cutting template. And if you do have acrylic templates, just take advantage of them too. Because this is a one-inch hexagon. So a lot of people have, have a one-inch hexagon acrylic templates probably laying around. So I'm just going to place that. Where do I want this? Is this one going in the center or where am I putting this? Well, let's just fussy cut right there. I like it. See? So now I can see that the these two strawberries are right smack in the center. Use my friction pen. I'm just going to trace. So I'm tracing on the outside line, right? So the seam allowance is included here. see you probably very faint where you see it but let me go ahead and cut this out to the side so now we got our little hexagon cut out and just like I did with the um, A2 piece I'm gonna put a little glue in the center don't put this much you put less okay and then I'm gonna eyeball it and place it on the center let's move this paper out of the way so you can see better so now it's on the center and now we're going to go ahead and glue baste it all around. Same thing would be for thread basting, but don't go all the way to the edge. If you're glue basting, leave that edge clear. Put glue on the fabric too, so that when you fold it over, it sticks like that. And then we continue. So Laura, now you see that the hexagon will never have those little tails or ears like a diamond or jewel shape would. And I keep on going around, put on the fabric inside the edge and put on the fabric. Now if you happen to go too close to the edge, you're fine. Nothing to stress about. But you probably just end up feeling it a little more uh, force when you have to sew the pieces together. And then we'll put the last bit here. And as you're folding your fabric over, um, make sure you feel the paper too. So you get a clean folded edge here. So if you, let's say if I did this and then I just kind of haphazardly for but this is exaggerated then obviously you won't get clean edges on your pieces right so you want to make sure that you kind of feel the fabric and the paper uh, you feel the edge and then push it down to baste it and then we got a little hexy so hexagons will never have those little tails they'll be very nice and crisp which is why I think a lot of people love hexagons because you don't have to worry about any little tails or ears sticking out they're just easy to put together right so make sure for tomorrow I want you to go ahead and cut out all your pieces your fabric pieces and glue base them so we can sew them start sewing them together so let me just do one more outside piece let's do B2 this one it's a random odd looking shape or should we do C2 uh, B2 is good, I think. Okay. So I'm going to do a background piece. I don't know why I picked orange for this one. I was supposed to use this for my background, but it was a good demo, right? Let's see. So I'm going to do a B2 piece. And let's say you don't have fuzzy cutting templates, so I'll just go ahead and eyeball this one. 
So then I'm going to actually go ahead and put a little glue. So don't put that much, but put some glue, okay? And then let's see. And when I do EPP, I'm never really too concerned about grain line. So I just place it whichever direction it fits in here. See, I can cut around now. And now I can just, because I have that glue holding the piece to the fabric, I don't have to worry about it moving. And I can just kind of eyeball the 3 8 inch seam allowance and cut around. It would have been nice if I had pressed my piece, but who's got time for that, right? We need to jump into EPP right away. So as you can see, when I eyeball it, it's obviously going to be a little uneven, but that's okay. That. And remember, this is the B2 piece right here, B2, right? And I glued it to the back side of the fabric, the wrong side, not the right side. And remember, this side is the one that's going to be raw, open edge, right? I'm not going to uh, glue base this edge because I'm going to end up opening it up anyways. So I'll start with one short side. You paste it and work my way around. Oops. Put a little too much glue, but it's okay. All my samples I just made with one set of papers too. So totally doable. And then go up here. And I just used Elmer's school glue. And papers come off really nice. It's just when you put too much, when you're too heavy handed with the glue, that it's gonna just like stick stick to the paper and the fabric. But when it does, take a warm iron, warm up the glue a little bit, and it'll, it'll usually pop off really easily then. So see this? Now I didn't glue base this last side because I'm gonna have to open it up anyways. So if we compare to one piece that has been trimmed already, well, obviously it's going to go there since we're looking at mirror image see how the seam along sticks out outside because this piece I've already fused it to the fusible fleece and trimmed it but this one it's not trimmed yet and let me flip it over and you can see it peeks out but the paper's right there right where it would have been inside this piece and here, this piece that I removed the papers from already, you can see it fits perfectly in there. there kind of hard to see white against white. Huh? Let's do it there. There we go. And this piece, this side, I did it glue based, so it's open. But because we put a little dot of glue to hold it to the uh, paper, it stays put. So that's why I do recommend um, glue basting for smaller projects like this. Especially for this kind of mug rug. So you, di so you don't have to thread baste all the sides for it to hold together uh, with the paper. And then it's just easy to remove it too. But I li like I said, you know the rules. We learn the rules, and then we break the rules. And this just makes it really quick, too, when you want to remove the papers. And you don't have to fiddle with all the corners. Okay? So, your homework for tomorrow. <laughs> I know you have all your pieces cut out if you got the PDF, or all your pieces marked if you got the paper templates. So go ahead and lay them out following this little... Um, block chart here and then glue baste all your pieces to your fabrics and making sure that you see the letters they should be facing up and you should see the fabric right side up when you turn it around and do not glue baste 
these edges. Unless you really, really, really want to, then I won't say anything. But the only pieces you want to glue paste all around, those are the hexagons, seven hexagons here. Because they're going to be sewn with the piece right next to it on all sides, right? So pick your seven hexagon prints and your outside fabric prints. Decide to go scrappy or you can just decide to go with uh, one fabric, your choice. And uh, we're going to, let's do, uh, oh yeah, have them all basted tomorrow so we can start sewing the pieces together. Okay, any questions before I hop off? Let me check. <laughs> By the way, I missed everybody so much yesterday. It was like the apocalypse was here. Like no Facebook access, no Instagram access. Like, what do you do? Ah! Let's see. Do, do, do. Caroline, you love hexes? Yes, I do too. You can never go wrong with hexes. So I think that's, I got all the questions. So if you're catching the replay, remember to put hashtag replay so I know you're watching the replay here. And let's see. And also if you have any questions, put the questions in the comments. And oh, Keith, did you want to know thread basting? Uh, oh, Joanna, the car stocks. Is it delayed? Because I tried to ship it like as fast as possible because I was hearing uh, USPS was going to take longer for their delivery times. Dang it. So sorry about that. Um, yes, yes, yes. So Keith, did you want to see thread basting for the hexagons? Why not? We're here. Thread basting is pretty quick. Let's grab I have hexagons. Since I'm here anyways, right? Should the pieces be cut with the pattern piece reverse? Oh yeah, I know what you're talking about. Because this is you facing facing you with the wrong side up, right? And then so when we flip it, technically that would be the right side, yes? So you could reverse it if you want to, but like if you have this kind of fabric, it you won't really tell what's left or right once you flip it, right? So it's yeah, totally up to you which way you want to decide to do it. As long as you're just looking at these letters facing you, just so you know where to place them. But if it's for some reason a mid image that you want to face a certain way, yeah, just think of the mirror image. Or you could even mark your pieces opposite way. Uh, your templates, uh, wait, uh, oh, Joanna, can you, uh, clarify your question? My brain's like, meow. So while you type your question in, so I, <laughs> simpler for me to understand, <laughs> then I'll go ahead and show thread basting. So... I'm gonna even with thread basting though I like to put it with a little bit of glue here on my fabric. Let's see that fit okay. I just rough cut this. And so I know we didn't talk about needles yet, but for now, just use whatever needle you have home at home. You don't have to be too super specific. I don't have a colored thread. I'll just use white. I think you can see here. And then. My, um, I have to take my glasses off because I can't see. It's terrible. Ah, there we go. 
So when you do thread basting, you don't have to use your good thread. You can just use whatever thread you have at home, like that come in those little travel kits or whatever. So let me trim this. But when I do piece, I like to use um, or fill 50 weight. I tend to just use white for everything. Oh, let me get Joanna's comment here. Oh yeah, if you cut out cut out your templates out of regular uh like uh do you mean like copy paper? Oh yeah, the I would wait wait till you get the cardstock because copy paper it's too flimsy and it's harder, yeah. It's much harder to work with yeah, yo no yeah, I would wait for card cardstock, yeah. You got plenty of time, Joanne. Wait for cardstock and yeah, print it on cardstock. So we got um, the little hexagon, and I wanted to put a little glue. Yeah, copy paper is so much harder. Wait for cardstock, definitely. And then now we have about roughly three-eighths of a seam allowance around. I got my thread. And I didn't have my... I, I wasn't expecting to sew today, so I didn't bring my little needle threader so then we put the paper uh, fabric over the paper like this like that then fold over the next edge so this is the tricky part since we're not gluing you got to make sure you're holding it up close against the edge and I think this is where a lot of um, folks get messed up when they first start because this edge is not clean and then when you're trying to butt the shapes up against next to each other and they're not basted right up against the paper that's when you get errors in your shapes not fitting and then I just pull through start with going through from the right side over to where the folded edge is did you see that so I started here in the back and come up to the top. So I did that already. But I'm going to do it one more time to secure the first stitch. Go into the back and up. And don't get knots. And now that corner is secure. Oh, yeah, Carolyn, that's a good suggestion too. Uh, Joanna, if you have junk mail at home and you happen to have those little arm. Um, what are they called? Like uh, flyers? They're usually stiffer. You can use that too. Just to trace your um, the one the templates that you cut out of card copy paper. Yeah, and then we go to the second side. I fold it over, and you want to make sure you feel the uh, paper as you're folding it over. Fold the seam allowance over. Hold it in place, and then come to the next corner. See how I feel that and then fold it over. So you gotta make sure you have this clear, clean edge. See, you don't want this where it's bubbly, right? It should be up straight up against the paper and you should see that sharp, clean edge. And now you just had the thread you were holding onto it. We just come over to this corner, put it down and the side that you were working on already and come up right there and now you just have this long connecting side and then repeat going up going down and up again to secure this corner and I know there are folks uh, there's there's folks that like to sew through the paper but honestly I kind of want to save my hands for piecing, sewing the pieces together because that's a lot of strain on your hands poking through this paper every time you want to baste. So I do not recommend it because you're going to get fatigued. This muscle gets really sore as you're sewing. And then you build up calluses too. Wonder clips, yes, yes. You can use wonder clips to hold it too. And then we come over to the third side Fold it up against the paper, you feel the corner, and 
hold it, hold it in place, come down in the side that you're working from and come up on the folded side and make sure you pull a little bit, don't pull too hard, you don't want to bend the paper just so that it's straight and then we repeat to secure that stitch and keep on going around. So I actually, uh, when I started EPPing too, I started with thread basting like this. And then it was kind of, it's kind of meditative too. It's relaxing. But then I found glue basting and it was so much faster and I could get to the sewing part and it was just joy and happiness. And I haven't turned back, but it's nice to be able to know how to thread base too. So you have options. So we come to this side, fold over. Go down in the side that you're working from and up in the side that you just folded over. And pull it a little bit to secure and then repeat the stitch there to secure the little stitch. And now we come to the last side. Fold down and tuck over the last side there. And then we repeat the little stay st t uh, tacking stitch or stay stitch here and at this point you could just trim the thread over here you don't need to knot it or you can go ahead and knot it because you're gonna rem more than likely you probably will rem uh, remove these basting stitches but a lot of people they don't either as well so you could leave it in and if you do decide to leave it in you can go ahead and just knot it there too or just leave like couple inches one or two inches and then you're done so thread basting is good too but I do prefer um, glue basting and I'm just losing my pieces <laughs> left and right <laughs> so that's a thread basted hexagon but I don't recommend thread basting for the outside pieces unless you want to go ahead Based all sides. So Keith, if you do want to uh, thread baste, I would suggest thread basting all the way around. Okay, and same process as the hexagon. Start with one side and just work your way around. Okay, and if you have any questions or if you have any problems, just holler at me. Pop, uh, post photos. Oh, I want to see photos. I need. You guys need to post progress photos. Share your templates, your cutouts. Show me your fabrics that you've chosen, which fabrics you're going to work with. Yes, yes, yes. Do share. It just makes the whole process more fun. So I think that was it. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if you guys saw Lucy's post here. So she likes to hole punch. What she means by that is punching a hole in the paper cardstock here in the center. So that when later when you want to remove it, you could stick a crochet hook or a little pen and just bloop, pop out the paper. So that's also an option. So that's what she means. But yeah, uh, I haven't seen paper templates sold with the little hole punch. Have you, Lucy? I don't think I've seen anyone selling them with the uh, pre-punched hole. So if you have a little um, hole puncher at home, just bloop punch a little hole and that's all you need to do let's see dun, 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 dun. I think I got all your questions oh thanks for putting the link to the uh, wonder clips Carolyn awesome so those are by uh, Clo Clover right wonder clips they come in multiple sizes so make sure you check out the sizes you want and now, uh, Carolyn, if you want to post a photo too under this thread under the video of the clips that you use, that would be helpful for all the beginners as well because there's so many different sizes now that Clover's come up with. So show us your favorite size. And also, if you have something clipped to a project that you're working on, that would be helpful too. So, and I think I got everything. So I hope you have all your pieces basted by tomorrow so you can start sewing your pieces together and I'll see you guys tomorrow and don't forget leave any questions you have in the comments under this video so I can get back to them and share progress photos 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 I want to see okay and I'll see y'all tomorrow